Father in heaven, your word is what you have given to your church to guide us, to comfort us, to cleanse us, to grow us, to humble us, to transform us. And you have also given us your spirit who knows how to help us in this growth that must take place in our lives, what power he has. And what power your word has to go forth and accomplish what it must accomplish in us. Lord, as we humble ourselves under your word this morning, we pray that you would glorify Jesus Christ. That you would glorify your grace in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that as our eyes are lifted up and our hearts and minds are lifted up to apprehend the magnitude of your grace... May we marvel all over yet again and worship, and may we trust your grace to be sufficient for us in all things. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Will you please take your Bibles with me and open them to Romans chapter 6. Almost 10 years ago, we said that very same thing to you. April of 2008, we went through Romans 6 back in a gym of a Lutheran church at 5 o'clock in the afternoon in Tempe when we were renting. It was that long ago. Some of you have aged quite a bit. (laughs) Today, what I want to do as we jump back in the book of Romans, because we haven't been in Romans since last year. Uh, We want to review today a little bit from where we've been. I want to give you an overview of the whole chapter of Romans, and then we'll also start in a little bit on the first few verses. My strategy all week has been, uh, we'll just, I'll just come up, I'll introduce it, and then we'll just have the guys back at the sound just push play and Smet will start in from April of 2008. But last night at 10 o'clock, I figured I'd better come up with something else, so... Have you ever said, this isn't what it looks like? Have you ever said that? You're in your room or in the room with your little brother. He's playing over there all by himself. And over there all by himself, he falls down all by himself. He starts bawling. Your mom steps into the room and sees you on the other side of the room swinging a toy around. And she sees your little brother on the floor weeping. And that's when you say, this isn't what it looks like. And in that case specifically, that truly is a false appearance. And we hate it when that happens to us. Because when the false conclusion is drawn about us from the false appearance, it makes your mom skeptical of you. I'm watching you. Right? You've been misunderstood. Mirages are similar. They are false appearances, so to speak. In a desert, in the heat, the one who is thirsty for water looks and sees what looks like a body of water in the desert, but it's not. The one dying of thirst walks and walks and finally realizes what he sees is a false appearance. He initially drew a false conclusion from the false appearance, and it now makes him skeptical about every body of water he sees. I don't know if you know this, but do you know that there are false appearances concerning the grace of God in the gospel? People think they are seeing what is characteristically true about God's grace But what they think is true about it isn't actually true at all. Like a mirage in the desert, they think they see something about grace and they draw conclusions from what they think they see. But what they think they see isn't actually accurate at all concerning grace. And as a result, they become skeptical of grace. The false appearance they think they see concerning grace eventually makes them skeptical. 
skeptical of grace because of the false conclusions they've drawn from the false appearance they're clinging to. How, how do you know personally? How do you know if you're seeing grace as it really is? How do you know that it's not a mirage of grace you're beholding? Let me ask you a different question. Have you become skeptical of grace? If so, have you ever considered whether your skepticism of grace is based on a false appearance and a false understanding or a false conclusion of it in your mind? Has it ever crossed your mind whether you have drawn a wrong conclusion about grace? That what you think about it isn't what it actually is. Romans chapter 6 clears up some false perceptions, some mirages of the grace of God. And in so doing, the one who has become skeptical as a result of embracing those false appearances, the skeptic of grace is corrected and silenced. To help you understand how these false appearances or mirages connected to grace arose and arise, we need to get a running start at it. And so I want to take just a moment, and since it's been a while since we've been in Romans, I want to review just a little bit in some broad ways. Believer, grace did the amazing thing in your life, according to Romans 1 to 5. In the presence of your own ungodliness, in the presence of your own sin, and in spite of any of your foolish attempts to try to distinguish yourself from the rest of all of humanity that's under the one-size-fits-all indictment of God against them, the grace of God in the gospel came to you personally and said, no self-reforming first. No self-improvement first. No good works from you as a sinner. The grace of God in the gospel came to you and simply said, believe Jesus Christ. Believe his wrath-satisfying death in your place, and while being an ungodly sinner, upon your belief in Jesus, God did the amazing. He declared over your sinful life the status of his righteousness. His righteousness, the righteousness that catches his eye, the righteousness that pleases him, the only righteousness that pleases him. You didn't earn that righteousness. You didn't deserve it. You didn't produce it. Through faith, by grace, God simply gave it to you. So grace stepped into the cesspool of your abounding sin in your life personally, and grace proved itself to be superabounding in the presence of your sin. That's the personal side of superabounding grace. We saw this from Romans 1 to 4. Then we got to Romans 5, especially verse 12 and following. But grace did something even more amazing than that personal thing for you. To save you, we found out, to save you, the grace of God in the gospel actually had to extract you personally out of the solidarity you were in with the rest of sinful humanity. You remember the illustration we used? The grace of God in the gospel didn't merely just pick you up like you were an isolated rock on the beach. But Romans 5, 12 indicates rather that when the grace of God in the gospel saved you with justification through faith alone, grace had to actually jackhammer you free from your cemented position in the slab of sinful humanity. You see, God doesn't just see individual sinners and their personal sin to overcome in salvation. He sees that. But he sees you and your personal sin actually embedded into the sinful mass of humanity, and he must overcome that to save you personally. He has to jackhammer you out with his grace to set you free from your solidarity with the sinful human race and put you into a new people in Jesus Christ. 
your personal experience of the grace of God saving you in the face of your own horrific sins actually rests within that larger work of the same grace of God which powerfully extracted you from the solidified sinfulness of the human race. That's what Romans 5 says. And that grace put you into Christ Jesus and his people. It's not just about little old you or me. So sin abounded in you personally, but the grace of God triumphed where your sin abounded. But even more amazing, where sin was abounding in humanity's solidified slab of sin, grace also superabounded in the presence of that corporate sinfulness. And again, grace didn't exhort you personally to reduce your own personal sinning first, to reform yourself first from your sinful ways. Your sinfulness just appeared to have to lie there present in the proximity of God's grace, and you believed Jesus Christ. God justified the ungodly one, Romans 4, 5. And grace didn't exhort the whole human race to reduce its corporate sinning so that it might be easier to extract you out of it. Grace did not say to humanity, you know, you all as one need to restrict your sinfulness if I'm going to save any one of you. Corporate sinfulness in the human race just kept going on and on and on while grace stepped in and saved you into Jesus Christ and his people. You see, where sin abounded, where sin increased, grace superabounded. That's Romans 5, verse 20. And that is where the false appearances of grace arise. This is where the mirages show up concerning grace. Here is where our weak minds and flesh and our poor spiritual sight are all easily fooled by false appearances or wrong conclusions about grace, and we start seeing mirages regarding grace that can actually wreck our walk with Christ. And Paul addresses two very dangerous false appearances or spiritual mirages that grace-thirsty believers need to see through clearly to the true grace realities beyond them. If you don't, See beyond them. The mirage concerning grace, the false appearance, if you grasp only that, it will turn you eventually into a skeptic of grace. And there are many who are skeptical of grace in the church. And you can't be skeptical of the grace of God in your Christian life. You must be confident in the grace of God in your life. No matter what false appearances or mirages arise in your own mind or are told to you by others. The first false appearance of or mirage regarding grace, and this is still by way of introduction here. The first false appearance is that sin and grace appear to have some kind of mutually beneficial relationship. And it comes in the form of Paul's question in Romans 6.1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? You see, sin gets to keep going on and on and on and on. Well, and grace seems to increase along with it. There's a mutually benefiting relationship, or so it appears. In justification... It is indeed true that where sin was flourishing in your life, grace in justification flourished beyond it. That's true. So the mirage is, the false appearance concerning grace is this. As you walk in the Christian life then beyond justification, well then more of the same would only make sense. Keep on sinning so that grace can keep increasing. And many become very skeptical of that mirage of grace. 
They hold it as true. And listen, grace does not make morally careless people. You're going to see that. But because of the mirage that some are convinced is there, that sin and grace are in some kind of partnership together, the false conclusions arise. After all, I mean, sin, they would say, appeared to go untouched by grace when you were justified. That's in their minds. That's in their thinking. Grace didn't ask you to do something about your sin first. And ask you to believe salvation was free. It cost you nothing. And the faith you exercised came by grace alone. Grace gave the appearance in justification that it tolerates sin. But that is the mirage. And from that, many are skeptical therefore, of grace, and worried that grace will only continue if you just keep preaching grace like that. It's just going to, people just continue to be tolerant of their sin. And that is a slanderous thought concerning grace, made by the grace skeptic. And the gospel makes its first of two defenses of grace right there. So in Romans 6, the big idea here in the chapter, the gospel twice defends grace against the slander of of the grace skeptic. The chapter can be broken down into two parts. Here's the first gospel defense found in the first 14 verses. Gospel defense number one, grace in no way is in partnership with sin in the believer's life. Verse one, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. In the statement that it's in partnership with sin, That comes from verse one, are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? The idea of continuing in sin is not, will we occasionally fall into sin? It's it's much, much more than that. Rather, the idea is habitual presence and persistence in sin, a willful, continual, established pattern of sin, all for grace's sake, for grace's increase in your life. And Paul answers that slanderous question with verse 2, may it never be. And that's why the caps up there, in no way, is grace in partnership with sin in the believer's life. That may it never be is the strongest idiom of repudiation in the New Testament. It means that the gospel believes this idea is so abominable that it is to be rejected in the strongest terms. The gospel recoils at such a proposition that grace and sin could somehow be in partnership with each other in the believer's life. God forbid it is the idea. By the way, there's only one way this mirage or false appearance of grace can actually arise. Do you know how? You have to do exactly what Paul did. You have to preach accurately the grace of God for salvation. By accurately preaching the free grace of God in the gospel for salvation, that is the only way this mirage comes up. Paul has been preaching a free salvation If he didn't preach a free salvation, if he was preaching instead that the sinner must do this first to restrict his sinfulness before God will save him, he has to do these good works, well, then this false appearance would never arise. False mirages, listen carefully, they are inevitable when you preach grace the way the gospel delineates it. And then you spend time defending grace after justification, just like Paul does in Romans 6. And so Romans 6, verse 2 to 14, is Paul's systematic dismantling of the slanderous thought that grace and habitual sin are in cahoots with one another in the believer's life. Then in Romans 6, verse 15, the second mirage or false appearance connected to grace comes up and it involves law. Look at verse 15. What then? What then? 
Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. And so there's gospel defense number two. Grace in no way is rivaled by law in the fight against sin in the believer's life. Grace in no way is rivaled by law in the fight against sin in the believer's life. When grace is preached accurately for justification, like it was in chapters three and four, there will be those who conclude wrongly. There will be those who will see another mirage, and it's this. Grace went easy on sin. Grace went easy on sin. To them, the mirage is that at justification, grace seemed to be unconcerned with sin. Sin seemed to be overlooked by grace. Even maybe, I don't know, given a pass? Is that possible that grace did that? And then there's another mirage connected with this one, and it involves a mirage or a false appearance concerning law. You say, what, what's the other mirage? It's the mirage that law is really effective against sin. And so what we have here in verse 15 is really a two-sided false appearance, a two-sided mirage. On one side, grace at justification appears, appears to let sin off the hook, to go easy on sin. The concern was just to believe. That's all you had to do. And on the other side, law appears to some, appears to be able to smack sin right across the cheek every time sin comes forward. There's a sin, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And it gets pummeled. That's the appearance. And both of those are mirages. False appearance. Grace isn't seen the way it should be, and neither is law in that case. And this law mirage is dangerous on two accounts. For those who believe this mirage about law, they believe it is unrivaled in its power in life. It is a power to get your life under. You need to be under law, and you need to let it reign over you. But if you believe that, Mirage about law, it will actually keep you from justification. Because the, that mirage about law says, look, your only way to distinguish yourself from the rest of sinful humanity is to use this law to restrain your sin and reform your living. God will see that and reward you for distinguishing yourself. <laughs> and besides, grace looked like it didn't even take one shot at your sin. Trust law to get you where you need to be with God. But the gospel completely dismantled all of that thinking in Romans 2, 3, and 4. This kind of thought is based on a false appearance of law, a mirage concerning law, that it appears to be able to batter and bruise and bloody sin. And the danger is that justification will be out of reach for the one who puts himself under that mirage. But this mirage concerning law is also dangerous on another account. You see, being under law can also make your sanctification as a believer impossible. This mirage concerning law tells you law is your only way to grow in holiness. It has power to bloody the nose of your sin on a daily basis. So get under law for your continued progress in holy living. And grace, well, grace, you remember, in justification, it didn't even appear to be concerned with your sin. Do you think it's going to be concerned now in your Christian life with it? People become skeptical of grace by believing these mirages or false appearances that are associated with both grace and law. They get duped by them. And so the grace skeptic makes slanderous statements against grace like this in verse 15. You're just going to sin because you're not under law, but you're under grace. And so the gospel once again must defend grace against this slander that is based on a mirage. 
When we say that um, grace in no way is rivaled by law in the fight against sin, we mean talking about the false thinking that law is more effective against sin in the believer's life, more effective than grace. And Paul says in verse 15, again, may it never be. The strongest repudiation of that wrong thought. And so verses 16 to 23 is the gospel's detailed defense of grace as a means to fight against sin in the believer's life. So there's the overview of the chapter. Now, I want to ask you this question. I want you to think with me about this. What is happening in Romans then as a whole at this point? Well, Paul is writing, if you remember, he's writing at the end of 10 years and three missionary journeys across the Roman Empire. And Paul faced these kinds of slanderous charges against the grace of God in the gospel everywhere he preached the gospel. People wrongly concluded that grace was unconcerned with sin, that actually when you get down into the tall weeds of it, grace grace actually benefits from sin. And Romans 6 is Paul's gospel defense of grace against that lie. And what else is happening in Romans? At this point, Paul had to face this also, the wrong conclusion that law actually is the best and only effective strategy against sin in the believer in the church. And that grace is simply weak in the face of sin, unconcerned. So don't be under grace Instead, be under law. He had to fight that. Romans 6 is Paul's gospel defense of grace against that lie too. And these two slanderings of the grace of God in the gospel, these two protests against grace, this controversial environment that Paul is in, that's the platform on which the next important gospel development is addressed in Romans, and it's your sanctification, progressive sanctification. Will one who is justified through faith alone by grace alone, will they actually progress in holiness of life day after day? Will they? Is grace effective for that? Does grace need any assistance in that? A little law added to it. Grace justifies, but does grace also sanctify the believer? Well, Romans 6 brings this all out into the open and tells us how grace really feels about indwelling sin in you and in me as believers. So what I want to do today is I want to back up to number one again, the big number one, and I want to start working through number one, that first gospel defense. So here's gospel defense number one again. Grace in no way is in partnership with sin in the believer's life. Therefore, as a result of that, Grace's strategy against sin in the believer is, number one, a matter of death and life for me. It's a matter of death and life for me. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. Watch this. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? We usually think of that phrase the other way around, don't we? It's a matter of life and death. And when we say that, we're talking about how serious or how grave the situation is. But for the believer in sanctification, sanctification is not a matter of life and death. It's a matter of death and life. Grace says sanctification is a matter of that. Consider that. We who died to sin, how will we still live in it? And you may say, well, wait a minute. Where did that come from? Because you can go back in chapter 5, you can go back through chapter 4, you can go back through chapter 3, and you can read everywhere you want about grace, but that didn't come up, that you died to sin. You simply won't find it there. But now is the time for the gospel to lay out that truth that you didn't see before. You might have seen some mirages, but now you need to see this, because this is the reality. Now, death is many things. But one of the most basic things that death is, is it is a relationship changer like no other. 
of the most radical kind. When death enters into one of two parties in a relationship, nothing is ever the same again for that relationship. This is the fundamental premise that grace is laying out for the believer in sanctification in Romans chapter 6. Your believer, your relationship to sin, your disposition to sin, your identity with sin has been fundamentally changed. In, in what sense has it been changed? Well, this chapter will reveal that your relationship with sin through death to sin means it no longer is master over you. We'll cover that more in the weeks to come. That dimension of your relationship to sin could only change if you died to your old master. A simple observation. How shall we who died to sin. Grace had you die to sin, believer, not the other way around. Sin didn't die to you. You died to sin. And wouldn't that be great if sin died to us? That it no longer was around or that it no longer had a taste for you, you know, instead of craving your blood, it somehow became a vegetarian. That'd be great but rather you died to sin. The grace of God in the gospel changed you radically through this death to sin, but sin remained unchanged in its character. Listen, sin would still seek to be your master if you let it. It hasn't changed. If it was given the chance, sin today still lies to you like it did before the cross, before you were saved by Christ. Sin will still lie to you every day. I don't want to own you. I just want to make you happy. And the next thing you know, you're in bondage. Jesus' death on the cross for you did not make sin lighter, easier, kinder, and gentler. Your death with Christ to sin changed you, believer. It changed your relationship to sin. You were transformed in your relationship to sin, not the other way around. The point is that the believer has died to sin and therefore, obviously, can no longer live habitually in sin. You see, it's a matter of death and life. Now, we still commit sins, but grace is telling you that you are not able now, after justification, to live perpetually in the same sins in which you once walked. You've been changed in your relationship to sin. Listen, death and life are completely incompatible, are they not? Where death is, Life isn't there. Where life is, death isn't there. So your death to sin, by grace's strategy, puts you in an incompatible incompatible position to living in that sin. Your being dead to sin is incompatible with you continuing to live in sin. Believer, you can't be both dead to and living in the same thing at the same time. Grace has achieved a once and for all radical breach with sin for you by you dying to sin. It's a promise. It's a fact. It's a reality. It's not a mirage. So Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, prior to saving grace, you were dead in sin, right? And then the grace of God in the gospel came, and the grace of God in the gospel did not demand that you die for your sin, but instead you find out 
Grace tells you that you died to your sin. And that is what makes your fight against sin in your life even possible. There is no fight against sin until grace brings about your death to sin. Then you can no longer live in sin like you used to live in it without Christ in your life. Oh, you will linger in sin sometimes and be absolutely stupid like me. But lingering in sin is not the same as living in sin like an unbeliever does, perpetually. What is crucial in your fight for holiness then is faith. Do you believe that? Do you cling to that? Do you trust that? Do you believe God when he says this is what his grace did for you and to you with sin? You died to sin. He just says it. And you've got to pull the emergency brake for a moment and just say, do I believe that? Grace in the gospel that you relied on to be justified, and you love that, don't you? I love that. It says also, you died to sin. Do you love that? Do you believe that? Like you believe in justification by faith alone. You have to champion this second reality as much as you champion the first. Do you take it by faith? Listen, if you don't accept that grace reality by faith that you died to sin, believer, your progress and holiness will be stunted to non-existent. You'll fight sin, but maybe you'll fight sin. And if you do, you'll do it by some other means, maybe law. At the outset of your fight for sanctification is this act of trusting the God who says this for you. Your sanctification begins with a fight for faith that what the grace of God in the gospel says about your relationship to sin is true. It's true. This is true. It's foundational. If you believe, understand this, if you entrust yourself, if you cast everything that you know of yourself on this truth, if you believe this, that you have died to sin, you will see how incompatible you are with still living in sin. So are you a believer in this sense? Because grace in no way is in partnership with sin in the believer's life. Therefore, grace's strategy against sin in the believer is a matter of death and life for me. Secondly, grace's strategy against sin in the believer, number two, requires me to investigate and know grace's achievements. Look how verse three begins. Or, do you not know? Full stop. Don't you know? You're not, you're not unaware of this, are you? Paul says. You're not ignorant of what grace has achieved in your life, are you? Look at the look throughout this chapter with me for just a moment and look at the emphasis on knowing. Or, or even on your weakness that has to be overcome, your weakness in grasping this grace. Look at this. Verse three, you see it. Or do you not know? Verse six, knowing this. Verse nine, knowing Christ. Look at verse 11. Even so, here's the first imperative of Romans six. Consider yourselves, reckon yourselves, Account yourselves, know this, contemplate this for yourself, think on this. Verse 16, he says it again, do you not know? Look at verse 19. Paul says in his whole discussion and teaching on the grace of God, he says this, I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. 
In other words, I'm putting the grace achievements for sanctification on the bottom shelf for you so you can get them because it doesn't come easy for you to get them. Do you realize how much must be known by you about the achievements of grace for you? And just like faith is huge at the foundational level for sanctification, so is knowing everything that grace has achieved for you. Listen, do you know what comes easy? What you don't even have to work to know? Mirages about grace. False appearances of grace. They are more easily seen and more readily known than these deeper, less visible achievements of grace like being dead to sin. You got to kind of dig in your Bible and find that one. But man, all you got to do is just get around a bunch of Christians and somebody starts grumbling about grace. It'll take you very little investigation to hear and know the complaints of grumblers in sanctification who slander the work of grace or abuse grace in sanctification, make it a license for sinning. You don't even have to go find them. Their blog posts and their Twitter feed finds you. Worst of all, some of them just come out of your own fleshly thinking within. You won't be ignorant of those mirages. You'll hear them and you'll know them rather easily. But you will have to work. You will have to investigate you will have to study. You will have to dig a little deeper and labor a little longer to grasp the real achievements of grace for you in sanctification that exists beyond the false appearances. You'll have to consider them and consider yourselves dead to sin. The weakness of your flesh will have to be overcome to grasp them. Verse 19, you'll have to look in Scripture for the passages that put these grace realities on the shelf that you can reach. It's going to take you effort to know it. Grace's strategy requires me to investigate and know grace's achievements. It does. Listen, if, if you're in a, if you're in a, a maze and you don't know the map that shows the way out, you'll never find it. You'll never find the opening. You'll just meander around making no real progress, one dead end after another. Listen, some people have constructed an unfortunate maze of sanctification because of their mirages of it. And if you ever get yourself in that unfortunate maze of sanctification that many have created and that they are lost in themselves, if you don't know these grace achievements, you will never be led out into the open field of sanctification where you can run freely in obedience to Jesus Christ. You'll never make progress. If you don't know these things, You'll only be befuddled by the mirages. You'll sit in a dead end somewhere in that maze with somebody else mocking what other Christians think about obedience. You'll never make progress. You'll be lost in the maze as they are. The blind will be leading the blind. And so you must give yourself to knowing this important chapter and subject in your Bible. Don't rest until you know what the grace of God has done for you, believer, in sanctification. Do you not know? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is so good to be back in this chapter that we love, this chapter that made a huge impact on us as a young church family, struggling 
to get on its feet. And Father, we need another workout from it and pray that you would help us. Lord, we love the doctrine of justification through faith alone, by grace alone. We love what grace did there. Would you grow our affections for what your grace has achieved for us in our sanctification? I pray, Lord, that this would bring comfort to those of us who are weary in our fight against our sin. I pray, Lord, that this would give us hope and it would give us um, promise that we would find ourselves fortified, energized by your spirit and by your word to run harder after your grace. Lord, I pray that this grace of yours, the achievements of grace on our behalf would also bring the gentle rebuke where it needs to be brought. Father, would you open our eyes as a church family on this and grow us some more. And Father, I pray for any friend here this morning who is hearing us describe something that is miles down the road from where they are because your grace has not yet shown them their need for a Savior. Would you show them this? Would you show them Jesus Christ crucified for forgiveness of sin? Show them that they do not need to try to distinguish themselves as one worthy, but simply, while yet being a sinner, they just must trust themselves to Jesus. Father, save sinners even today. And every sinner you save, you sanctify. Because you save them by your grace and you sanctify us by your grace. We rejoice in your grace and under it. And we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.